Hello and welcome to another A Tippling Philosopher with myself, Jonathan M. S. Pierce, and my esteemed guest, James <laughs> Croft. Uh, so, welcome, James, to this uh, chat that we're going to have a fireside chat in summertime. Um, uh, just for those who don't know you in in the audience, people watching uh, both live and and later, uh, would you like to just introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. I'm James Croft. I'm the leader of the Ethical Society of St. Louis. The Ethical Society is a very unusual type of congregation. So think of everything that a regular church might do, except we do it without God or traditional religion. So it's a humanist congregation. And I've served as the professional leader of that congregation, or as one of them for eight years, and as the, the only one for the past almost three years now. So um, it's my my full-time job to create community for people who are not traditionally religious. Which sounds like an absolutely fantastic job. I mean, I, I something I'd love to do because the way I understand it is that you're, you're as well as doing all the kind of organizational, um, you know, community-based things and events uh, and and all all the weekly things you do you also provide a sermon very much like at the same uh, like a sunday sermon you're very much like yes. the vicar of a of a non-religious community where you get to i presume when you are delivering them uh get to talk about anything you want to talk about <laughs> which sounds pretty cool yeah it is it is pretty cool it's not everything i want to talk about exactly because we do actually structure the year right, with okay. an overall annual theme which we break down into monthly themes so we try and give some structure to the experience the idea is that each month will be a series of presentations orbiting around a central concept so for one year we did a year on the emotions and every month was either a single emotion or a linked pair of emotions. And so we had we had of joy month and desire month, which was a good one, and hate and fear month and things like that. So the, there is some structuring, but unlike in a traditional religious community, we don't have a scripture or a creed and we don't have a set liturgy. So we don't have to do the same thing every year. We don't have to follow any particular text from beginning to end. So we are very flexible in what we can do. And it is a lot of fun. It's been really quite amazing. I hope I hope you refer to Star Wars in like anger leads to fear and fear leads to I, I forget the quote. So I probably You bet I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh nice. yeah. I get a lot of science fiction references in my presentations on Sunday mornings. That's uh, something I'm well known for. My community is probably sick of the amount of times that I reference science fiction properties in my presentations. It, it's funny, I'm just embarking on a book. Um, so I'm, I'm writing a feature article. So both, just for the audience, both of us write for Only Sky, uh, the media platform for the non-religious. Uh, and my next feature article is on... Uh, aliens what what how would we would change or how religions would adapt or not adapt or be challenged in in light of finding alien life intelligent life and in fact one, one of my last videos with dr aaron adair we we presented this so we basically presented my feature article and it turns out we've ended up agreeing to write a book together on this and at the beginning i only say this because i was writing the introduction today just between things and i i put in a bunch of cultural you know modern cultural pop references to sci-fi and then looking up quotes from like Ray Bradbury about how important science fiction is to to it's just like philosophically one of the greatest is the genre for doing philosophy for understanding your place in in the world and discovering stuff about yourself is that so it's a lot of talk to to lead into is that is that what you feel I mean because I, I remember reading something of yours that you sent me which was talking a lot at the beginning about how you were heavily influenced or had a uh, this kind of sci-fi type childhood yeah, I, I agree with that. I think that there's something about science fiction as a genre that is deeply humanistic a lot of the time. I think that it combines the sort of imaginative, forward-thinking ethos of humanism with the uh, hard-headed scientific rationalism. If you think about it, science fiction, I mean, it, is, it isn't always this, but but in theory, you might think of it as kind of an imaginative projection of what our future might look like. 
Mm. And like all fiction, it's concerned with humanity, with our relationships, with our hopes and fears, with our dreams for society and for ourselves. That's basically what fiction enables us to explore. But science fiction does it within a sort of constraint that says we're going to try and be at least plausibly realistic about some of the things that we explore. We're not going to change the rules of the universe in order to explore these questions. And so it becomes a sort of thought experiment about the human future. And I think that is quite humanistic. Yeah, well, yeah. Um, funny you should say that. Uh, this is my sp spammer clock on the video where I just spam one of my books randomly. But I've, I wrote a fiction series. I've written, oh, I haven't finished it, but this is called Survival of the Fittest. Uh, first one's Metamorphosis. And, and I was trying to do exactly that, which is um, how can I shoehorn in a load of philosophy and just mm. try and explore what the world is to, to me or to different people? And I thought well, I could either do science fiction or I can do a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> right? Basically, those are your two options, some kind of dystopian future or sci-fi uh, or both. Uh, and so I went for the, the for the viral outbreak as, the, as being <laughs> being the vehicle to do that. But but you're right. There's there's something about sci-fi that allows you to just go right. What do I want to think about? Yes, I think that's true of post-apocalyptica actually as well. It's also one mm. of my favorite genres. There's something about imagining what human relationships would look like and society would look like when it's pushed to the absolute limits. Right? Yeah. What? How would human beings react? under the most extreme circumstances imaginable. So nuclear apocalypse, you know, zombie attack, massive viral pandemic. It kind of has a way of forcing us down to the fundamentals about what it means to be human, because a lot of the craft of socialization is cleared away. And then you get some sort of theory about what human beings are really like at root. And so I kind of think that that post-apocalyptica is a very interesting genre as well. I haven't, I have to say, I haven't read any of your books, and so now I'm really interested to read that one. Oh, yeah, I'd be, I'd love you to, yeah. Um, and 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 when we, you know, when you do investigate those things, often the questions are moral, aren't they? Which is like, you know, what's yeah. it like to be a human, or what, what does it mean to act in these situations? Which is invariably are like, how do you, you know, moral dilemma, city, isn't it? So. Um, Yes, moral and also, as you say, existential. Some people might say spiritual. So we explore at the Ethical Society of St. Louis and all the ethical societies the big questions of human existence, which all religions have always explored. We just do it without reference to any of the doctrines, dogmas, structural beliefs and practices of the traditional religions. One of the interesting things for the purposes of our conversation now is that religions have always appreciated the value of narrative. I mean, if you think about it, that's what scriptural texts are in, in large part. The, the Bible is a series of stories, and those stories encode moral messages. And that's how human beings communicate values to each other most effectively. We communicate them through stories. And that's something that the secular world, I mean, the secular world generally understands that. All our modern myths are stories and Marvel mm. movies and all these things like that. There's mm. the, the sort of moral myths, Disney, that, that form our cultural expectations and understandings. But the atheist movement has been quite resistant to the use of narrative stories, emotional engagement to, to get people to appreciate what it what it's trying to do. So that's something that religion does better than the atheists in general. Well, and, and that's interesting because, in uh, again, one of the things you sent me was about, um, you know, creating a, an origin story. Well, not necessarily creating one, but, you know, thinking about origin stories in different religions you know every religion has its own creation mm. uh, and thus origin story and what would be a humanistic atheistic origin story and and can you create a narrative and do would you want to create a narrative out of it i suppose what, what are your thoughts on that yeah it's an interesting thing isn't it that one of the things that religions tend to try and do for their members is situate humanity within a bigger picture to tell a grand narrative of which humanity is an important part. Usually it's a very important part in these religious stories. Often it's, you know, the, in the Christian story, it's the, the only animal given the, the spark of the divine, the breath of God, right? So often humanity has a very special picture, but it, it's still nonetheless a part of a bigger story that goes on beyond human beings. And 
particularly beyond any individual human being. And there's something that's potentially valuable in that because people need to feel part of something bigger than themselves. It's one of our big yearnings is not just to live for ourselves, but to feel part of something greater that will continue after we're gone and that has been in process before we came on the scene. And there's lots of ways to tell a secular origin story. I mean, I'm partial, this is very predictable given our conversation, but I'm partial to the sort of Carl Sagan style story of the cosmos. He has the calendar of the cosmos, right, where he, he situates humanity within the entire span of time from the beginning of time up until now and shows how small all of human civilization really is compared to the whole span of cosmic time. And I, I love that way of talking about humanity. It just kind of up, it gives me a sense of uplift and excitement. But there are other ways you can do it, right? You can talk about something much more biological. There's an evolutionary story. And that's really the, the cool thing about science is it's given us a creation story that's much richer and more interesting and profound than anything that a religious mind was able to come up with. If you, if you examine... You know, really just read the creation accounts in, in something like Genesis, the different accounts of creation there, and compare them to what we know actually happened. What actually happened is way cooler. I mean, it's way, way, way more complicated and more rich and more exciting. And our connections with all other life on Earth are, are much more profound than anything a, a religious imagination came up with. So science can often furnish us with really interesting origin stories and other kinds of existential narratives that can help shape our lives. The thing is, you need people to tell those stories. You need people, mm. you can't just give people a scientific study and be like, here's how human beings came out. I, I suddenly <laughs> felt like I was in your congregation there, like Edward, you were <laughs> excited at the front telling me a story of creation. I was with you, James. I was, that's good. I was there. That's good. Hey, yeah, amen, I've been brother. Hey, amen. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a skill that specific, it's something I think about a lot because it's my whole job, but hmm. specific humanists have had the skill of telling the story of humankind back to itself in a way that's uplifting and exciting and grand. But it's not one that we have many institutions dedicated to speaking about. One of the benefits that traditional religions have is that they tend to have lots of institutions where there are people whose whole professional lives are based around telling the story of the religion. But there are not many places which its whole reason for being is to tell the story of humanity, right? That just doesn't really exist outside odd organizations like my own. And that's something that secular society often doesn't do very well, is, mm -hmm. put, is find people who are good storytellers about the the human picture and when someone comes along who happens to be able to do that look at the the benefit uh, the massive success of that book sapiens for instance right yeah. whatever you think about the book it was a humongous success and i think it's because it, it provided exactly the sort of thing we've been talking about a grand narrative of the human species which everyone can feel a part of whether you're religious or not you could buy that book and feel like yeah this is amazing i'm part of this whole story of humanity so people hunger for those big narratives but the secular world isn't always that good at providing them i was listening to a talk that you were doing with ryan bell who for those who don't know are um oh i can hear myself repeating on you uh, sorry echoing on your have you got me on I can't I can't hear you. You are not on my speakers, I promise. But I'll okay. mute myself. Oh no, that's fine. Okay, yeah, that's fine. So anyway, uh, I, I was listening to you speaking to Ryan Bell, and he said something. He said quite often, um, so and I was gonna say that he's a guy that was a, a preacher who then gave up God for a year, and then lo and behold, he became an atheist. So there you go. Um, but he said that that he was on he he uh, one of the common questions is, you know, when when you're an atheist, he, and he asks this to an atheist, don't you feel there's something bigger than you? Something isn't, you know, just kind of what you were just talking about, James. And he uh, he was saying to this atheist, you know, surely there's something bigger, you got this bigger thing than you. And the atheist, without missing a beat, just said, yeah, us, you know, us is bigger than me. And that's this idea, and I love that. I thought that's really interesting. It made me have a little think about oh, okay, it's, it's not just me. It's 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 all of this, and, yeah, and the legacy and blah blah blah. But yeah, I think that's true. I think it's a great response. One of the 
frameworks that I use to think about my own work comes from a group called the Sacred Design Lab, which is trying to come up with ways to engage people in 21st century spiritual development outside traditional religions. And they have a, a phrase they use, which is belonging, becoming, beyond. And that's the three things that they think that people get out of religious communities or spiritual practices. A sense of connection to other people, that's the belonging piece, the community, the feeling of, of, of being in a place where you belong, where you're wanted. Second, becoming the sense of growth, spiritual and personal growth and development, becoming the sort of person that you want to be. And beyond is what we've just been talking about. It's, I think of it as connection to something bigger than ourselves. And there, it, obviously, in traditional religions, this might be God, right? Or it might be some spiritual concept that's bigger than the natural world. But for non religious folks, I still think there are many beyonds that we can feel connected to. We can feel connected to the community, either the community in which we live, our national community, the world community, or the community of humanity that stretches from, you know, whenever there were human beings to whenever the last human being will roam the earth. And there's a community you can feel yourself a part of. So that's like the us. But then we've spoken about, you know, the story of the cosmos, which we're all part of the natural world or of nature as a whole or of all life. The, there are many ways to activate one sense of being bigger than being part of something bigger than ourselves. The question is, where do you who activates that for you and where do you consciously go to get that feeling? Because I think a lot of people who are not religious, they just sort of go without as if they they can't get that anymore. But that's not true. We can all get that feeling. We don't need religion for it. Sure. And before we, we dwell on that sort of point a little bit, just get a super chat. And thank you so much, James. What a wonderful supporter of the channel. In fact, he's uh, he's been a part of uh, one of the videos I did as uh, being a former Jehovah's Witness. So thanks, James. I was a humanist until I lost that positivity about humanity's nature and future uh, and, uh, and future part of it. Um, I still love people, but I no longer believe in them. Mm, interesting. Obviously, That's there's a, a lot of fun. A lot to unpick there. Um, maybe that's a negative view of humanity. How would you, as a secular sermonist, uh, <laughs> as you are, I'm not sure that's a word, uh, in your position in the ethical society, how would you maybe deal with something like that? I Firstly, I want to say to James, great name. It's worked out well for me, and I hope it works out well for you. Um, <laughs> I feel the same way a lot of the time, particularly now. I think that many of us who, who consider ourselves humanists have had what we might call our faith in humanity very severely tested over the last few years. I don't know what it was for you, but for me, it's been things like the election of Donald Trump and seeing the attack on the, the US Capitol and realizing how fragile our democratic institutions are and how willing people are to well the supreme court and super, supreme yep, court in the last supreme week court. with the uh yep. with the main decision and the gun rights decision today yep. i think i think there's a democratic and constitutional backsliding that's going yes. on yes yeah both, we, we seem to both be worldwide but also in america yeah yeah, yeah Sorry, brexit is a good example in britain right that it just boggles one's mind a massive act of of national self-harm that will do enormous damage to British people and to the people of Europe over the next few few decades. I mean, rising extremism everywhere, rising economic inequality, the cost of living crisis, the the environmental destruction we're wreaking on the planet. Mm -hmm. Human beings are not doing good right now. And when mm -hmm. I was a kid, when I was a teenager, you know, I had a huge amount of hope for the future. I think I am, imagined that we would just that the, the sort of story of humanity from now on was just progress you know like we were just going to get better and better and my job would be to help us get a little bit better than we were before and now i realize that many of our fundamental institutions are rotten our democratic institutions are rotten our economic system is rotten that we need wholesale change that we've built a world of exploitation and misery for billions of people and that you know my my liberal illusions have been totally shattered and the question is what do we do with that and does that mean we we give up on people or we think so where i've come down to on this james is that a couple of things firstly i never thought humanism meant 
believing that people were fundamentally good. I always told people that what it means is that, that people are fundamentally animals, right? With the capacity to be good, but with also the capacity to be evil and to create evil systems that ruin everything for everyone. So it's not actually outside the realm of humanism to, to appreciate the depth of depravity of the human organism and of the society that we've built. The second thought I have is what other option do we have than to work to improve our society? I suppose we could say, you know what, given how terrible everything is, I'm just going to work for myself and my family and I'm not going to care about anything bigger. But for me, there's even something incoherent in that, because if I care about my own welfare and the welfare of the people I, I, I love, then it's because of the sort of thing that we are and every person is the same sort of thing as me and my family so I, I feel like just to be consistent i need to have some consideration for the rest of the world and the final thing i'd say is there is a quote that was taught to me by one of my mentors marshall gantz um, from jewish philosopher maimonides and he says hope is belief in the plausibility of the possible over the inevitability of the probable Hope is the belief in the plausibility of the possible yeah. over the inevitability of the probable. What probably is going to happen is not inevitable, and that what possibly might happen is at least plausible. And I still think a better future for humankind is at least plausible. And so even though it probably won't happen, I'm willing to work for it. But I feel, I feel what you're feeling, James. Wow, that's an amazing answer, James. You you are hopefully got something out of that. Um, uh, so you mentioned something. Uh, well, first first of all, let's go back to talking about you know organizing atheism and um, your sort of sermonizing that you were talking about earlier. And of course, uh, you are now coming to an end of of your role in that position at, at a at an institution that's 140 years old, really, really like famous, in, incredibly. Um, you know, respected institution that the Ethical Society of St. Louis is, uh, and you are, you've done, as you said, eight years there, um, uh, and now you're feeling it's time to move on. How, how do you feel about that? Are you, is there a bit of trepidation? <laughs> I'm terrified. I have no idea what I'm going to do. Yeah, I mean, so, so for, for your viewers' benefit, I, I have been with the Ethical Society of St. Louis for eight years now. My, my first six, I was um, the secondary professional clergy person for the community. And the last two and a bit now, I've, I've been in the senior position where I'm kind of running the show. And if you cast your mind back two and a bit years ago, you will realize that I took over at almost exactly the time that COVID hit. And so, whoop, whoop. yeah, excellent time to take over running a community organization so all of my focus at least for the first 18 months was really on transitioning the community online on developing a whole range of online offerings to keep people feeling connected to each other mm. and give people a sense of hope even at a time that was very challenging we went from having no online programs at all ever wow. to having a full suite of i think five or six programs every week in one week we closed on a on a tuesday uh in march and by that sunday we had a weekly five or six online programs and so i think we did an amazing job um creating you know just social you know happy hours and board game nights and our sunday morning main community gathering with speakers from all over the world and everything like that just seamlessly transitioned online i'm really proud of it um, but it was really, can I swear on your, your show? Yeah, go for it. It was really fucking hard and exhausting and not that good for my health. I think a lot of people experienced when, you know, suddenly I used to, you know, walk to work and cycle around town all the time. And suddenly I spent all my time sitting in a chair in front of a computer for 18 months. And it was not that great for me, honestly. Um, yeah. And my sense is... Firstly, I'm burned out, right? Just to be honest, I need to do something else because I don't have anything more to give that place right mm. now. 
and they deserve someone who can can come in with with more energy and excitement about it than I have. Um, and also, I think the community is in a different place than when I began. You know, I think that a lot of community organizations are regrouping and assessing the impact that COVID has had on them and how they want to go forward. And that's a very difficult sort of transition that I think needs someone with particular skills to manage. And my skills are more in the kind of helping the community get better known and reaching out and making connections with other local organizations and things like that have a, a particular skill set that I don't think is necessarily exactly what they need right now. So, um, if, I mean, I'm not a huge football buff, but, you, you know, in, in football terms, soccer terms, you'd be like good at getting the, the smaller teams promoted to a decent enough level and then let another manager take them on to, to that. You know, you, it's about getting them out there and doing that really tough job of, of of developing something and putting these things in place and then you know you can let someone else you know ride the waves that you've created i'm not going to be able to give you a footballing analogy because i'm not enough of a football fan to continue it but that sounds roughly right to me i mean i just think that i've done for them what i can do right yeah. now and what i have the energy to do and i hadn't expected that um, to take over, you know, and then, you know, three years afterwards to be to be going somewhere else. But it, it's definitely the right decision. But I have no idea what I'm doing. I mean, one of the funny things is this this job is a very small niche, right? It's already yeah, yeah. Yeah. clergy in any denomination to move on and do something else because no one really understands what someone who leads a, a congregation actually does. Um, but when you lead a congregation in an incredibly tiny movement, we only have 24 ethical societies or so, and only a handful of those have professional leadership anyway. Um, there, so there's maybe six people in the world doing my exact job right now. So transitioning out of that is very strange. So I'm in the place where I think a lot of people are post-COVID, where I know I need to change and to reassess what's important in my life. I don't exactly know what it's going to look like, but oh well, best of luck. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you've been working for this atheist uh, sort of free thinking organization, and like me, you're a Brit, but you are living in America. Uh, I believe married to an American. Yes, um, is that correct? And so, but you you are you're a brit and i presume have come from not a particularly religious background i don't know you, please tell me about this because i'm interested in what took you from there to where you've been for the last 8 years and being so interested in these ideas when it wasn't part of like i could imagine that if you were like a huge christian as you're growing up and then rejected yeah. that and then that's really important uh but for someone who's not within that context how did you get to where you are now yeah, really great question. I'm not religious. I've never been religious. My my parents were not religious. I never went. They never took me to church when I was growing up. But I put it like that because I was a choir boy when I was a kid. And so on Sunday mornings, I used to sing in our school's chapel. And I went to one of those old English private schools that has a Christian foundation. And so is technically a Christian school today. But it's not like American listeners will... They always get the wrong idea when I say I go to, went to a private Christian school. It's not like an evangelical school. Yeah, the, yeah. The, no. these, all the old private schools are religious in that way. So but I, I was the same. Yeah. I went to I went to a boarding school very similar down near Brighton, which you know old Sussex Flint buildings and this massive chapel and a huge sandstone altar. But it just bred like sort of boredom more than anything. But yeah, anyway, carry on. Boredom and investment bankers, I imagine. If it's anything yeah. like my school. Um, no, they're great people. Great people went to my school. Um, I, yeah, I, I was fascinated by it. I, I've actually always been fascinated by religion. I, I really liked that there was this space that people went to, to be part of a community, to be encouraged to be better than they are, to live in a better way, and to connect with those that beyond that we've been talking about. I found it fascinating and intriguing and interesting. And I, I was always interested. I always liked singing in the services. I didn't believe a word of what they said. 
and and I tried, you know, I, I read and that you recognize that at the time. So at oh, the time, yeah. you're like... I was a well known atheist in high school. I had a lot of arguments with my Christian Union friends. Yeah, I, I mean, I was really interested in religion. I read the Bible cover to cover and the Quran, the Bhagavad Gita, and other religious texts. And I also read works of apologetics. You know, one of my friends lent me a book called Who Moved the Stone, which is a famous book of of Christian apologetics, right? So I was into reading the arguments. Um, I just didn't, I was never convinced by any of them. It just seemed totally obvious to me. And honestly, even though I have a lot more appreciation of the richness of the world's religious traditions now than I did then, I still think that it's blatantly obvious that religions are human created cultural constructs invented by the people in particular times and places to help them make sense of their experience. I mean, that seems totally undeniable. And the, the, the hypothesis that no, actually, they're real records of supernatural beings by particular historic figures. Seems so ludicrous to me in comparison. Yeah, I you're absolutely right. I've really got to the stage recently where, and and you know, having written so many books and some of them on really particular topics like the nativity, the resurrection of Jesus, all these things, and I've got to this position where I just think it's utterly nonsense, and I, and I and I can't believe that people genuinely still believe this stuff. And and then I think, oh, there's no point in me writing any more about this because, God, it's all just such nonsense. And then well, I'd like, like yeah. get sucked into writing another book or whatever because I enjoy doing it, right? <laughs> but... Sucked in again. Wow. No, I, I mean, I don't want to be unfair to my religious friends and colleagues because I work alongside a lot of religious leaders, a lot of clergy of other, other religions. Um, but, I mean, my, my honest feeling is if you take a sort of sociological, historical, like anthropological perspective to religion, which I think we should, right? We should see it, you know, in its context as something that human beings have done throughout millennia and millennia. There've been tons of different religions. They've all had different claims and ideas, but they're all fundamentally trying to provide a kind of sense of humanity's place in in the cosmos and they do it in different ways and i just i really i mean if you think about what a, div, a truly divinely inspired religion would actually look like and the sort of teachings that you would expect a god to offer to the followers of that religion i th i think that it's blatantly obvious that that's not what any of the religions we have actually oh, I, have. Don't know. I, mean, I don't know like don't eat shellfish and like, right. cut, like cut the end of your penis off Right. So, and that's the interesting thing. I mean, because, so I'm, my doctorate is in human development. So before I was clergy, I did a doctorate in human development. And so I'm really interested in human beings and learning. And, and when you study human development, you study lots of different disciplines like psychology and cognitive science and how people get to be the way they are. And it, if you look at these sorts of things that religions are concerned with, not just the specific things they actually say, but the sorts of things they think it's important to make rules about, it's really clear that they're things that are basically quite significant to the organization of social groups and to the perpetuation of, of the human species, basically. It's all about who is who should rule over who, what people should eat, Right, because that's actually very important if you're going to keep people alive, particularly in certain contexts. And what people, who should people sleep with, and what's okay with who they should sleep with. Like these are, uh, and other things to regulate the harmonious, you know, activities within a society, like not stealing and you're respecting other people's property. Basic moral codes that are the same in many, many different human cultures across time. But nothing in it has the whiff of the divine about it. Right. No, nothing in it. It's like, oh, that's actually. Well, it's, there are profound insights. There are religious leaders. You know, you can read some of Jesus's parables and teachings and think, wow, the world really would be amazingly better if people actually acted. Like yeah. That. Those when they become when they're a little more abstract in, in in nature, but rather than it. But when it becomes like you sort of going with that, these particular rules. Yeah. For example, circumcision. Right. right. What you know, and it's interesting. I'm reading a, a book. I'm serializing it in a video series on slavery, uh, and 
uh, Hector Avalos's book, and it, he, he, I've just read a, a section on there about circumcision, which is like along with what you're talking about, which is actually people don't fully know why circumcision exists because if you are looking at it anthropologically, you're going to be saying, right. This is obviously not a directive from God because that'd be weird anyway. Like I'm going to design humans like this and then make them cut bits of the stuff that I've designed onto them off of them because yes, it is odd when you look at it from that perspective. Certainly. So and one of the prevailing theories it was originally a mark of of slavery, a mark of ownership, and and that then got you know changed and morphed over time into being a. Mm. a a, an identifier of a particular group of people but anyway sorry i was just going off on one about circumcision but no yeah. i think it, it's interesting it's i mean i don't i mean i guess i can i i can sort of understand that you might read the stories of jesus for instance and think this is a really superlative human being right someone who has profound wisdom about how we should treat each other and what society should look like and really saw further morally than many people of his age. And I think that that's all probably true. You know, I think that that's there's a lot of moral insight in in the life of Jesus. But I don't think that it that you could actually point to anything specific and say that could could never reasonably have been thought of by just a particularly morally insightful human being and and so i mean i i guess to get back to how did i get into it i've always been interested in religion as a phenomenon and the, and the, the passions and powers that it unleashes in human beings but i've never been religious so there is a, in that way the moment i found out that you could lead a congregation without being traditionally religious it seems actually very obvious that that's something that i would want to do but it was a kind of circuitous path to, to find out that that existed it took me until you know my late 20s to even find out there was such a thing as an ethical society but the moment i discovered that there was i i knew i wanted to lead one so it, it really felt like a calling and now i'm not going to do it anymore i don't know what i'm going to yeah. do yeah, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta generate another calling. Um, I know. What, what? So, speaking of like sort of general arguments about atheism, gen, you know, atheism in general. What would you say is both the strongest argument for atheism and the biggest challenge to atheism in terms of philosophical arguments? I am a huge nerd about apologetics and counter apologetics and arguments for and against God. And at the same time, I find that I often take a very different approach to those arguments than many, even my philosophically minded atheists. Right. So I, I th there is a movement right now among some atheists to take um, contemporary apologetics very seriously and to really dig into the arguments of Alvin Plantinga and Ed Fazer and Josh Rasmussen and things like that and really look at contemporary apologists and and take their their arguments really really seriously and rigorously which if you're a philosopher of course you should do you know academic philosophers should always always take the arguments they approach very very seriously I just can't find it in me to 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 take them that seriously and I think the reason why comes down to the, the ultimate reason why I am an atheist which is that Everything in my experience tells me there obviously is no God, right? That, that, that the world just doesn't look anything like it would look if it was designed by a perfect intelligent being. And it just seems like everywhere you look, the, the world screams the fact that it is an unfolding process without a telos, without a plan behind it. Like, you know, we were just talking about the nature of human morality, right? Why? Why do we care about the, the moral things that we care about? Why do human beings care so much about sexual morality, which I know we're going to talk about later? Why do they make up rules about what people can eat? Why do they care so much about social hierarchy? It didn't need to be like that, right? If God's creating things, it could be totally different. We could have totally different moral instincts than what we actually do. Or one of my areas of research interest is human cognition, why we think the way that we think. And it turns out that human cognitive mechanisms are incredibly biased in systemic ways, right? So we can predict exactly how human beings are going to be biased in particular circumstances. And then you might ask, well, why? 
why are our cognitive mechanisms so bad at reliably tracking truth, but actually reliably track falsehood in specific and identifiable ways if we were designed by a perfect design? Well, because we weren't, because we evolved and we have our cognitive mechanisms are, are mainly designed to help us survive and reproduce, right? Not to help us track truth. Uh, and yeah, obviously there's I, this, this is... It just well, no, that's... obvious to me, honestly. And and so when I when I encounter a philosophical argument that's like super technical um, and like has a hundred stages and is basically some kind of attempt to rationally prove the existence of God, I've honestly got to the point where I I say to myself, which is more likely that God exists and this incredibly complicated rational proof is is correct? And that uh, every aspect of my experience is wrong, right? Or that there's a mistake in the proof that might be very difficult to articulate exactly what it is, but that every aspect of my experience is right. And I just say, you know, I think I'm just going to go with experience and not even really engage with the proof. Two things to say to that. One, it sounds you mentioned Plantinga. Uh, he talks about properly basic beliefs to argue yeah. for oh Christianity, for, to argue for theism. I'd say you've got a properly basic belief in atheism, which is, I think, a genuinely <laughs> you fair, could say that. I think it's a genuinely fair a criticism of that argument, which is to say if you say, think that the theism is a properly properly basic belief that you just have and there's no rational basis for it, and we're like, I could say that the same for atheism. And James is saying. Hey, look! I the, every everything I feel just in, in my core leads me towards atheism. But uh, what well, it's you more also, than that. I, I, can I just nuance well, it? A bit I, I, well, I, no, I, just, ahead, I would John. just add. Well, I was just going to add that, that. Also, what you were saying on top of that is a bunch of abductive arguments. So abductive right, arguments are right. inferences to the best explanation. So yes. and th these are what I've been talking about loads recently in a load of my videos, which is like, okay, you've got two hypotheses. One is a God hypothesis. One is the not God hypothesis. So look at all these data points, like you were just sort of saying, look at all these things. What what does my experience tell me? What, what does it best support? Does, does all this suffering best support theism or atheism well i could construct some contrived way to make the data fit theism but actually it just seems to m more simply fit the 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 atheistic hypothesis so i think those abductive arguments are really really strong yes and, and i think that that's really it, it's not a feeling so much as it really is that i think the best explanation of our experience is that it is not designed by an omnipotent creator. Mm -hmm. And that's ultimately philosophically, my main influences are, are pragmatist. I am in the pr pragmatist tradition in my philosophical training and writing. So that's people like John Dewey and, and Sanders Peirce and, and William James and people like that, mm -hmm. and Cornell West, a contemporary example. And what pragmatists tend to think is that the purpose of something like an explanation is to help us understand our experience, is to help mm -hmm. us navigate the world in which we live. That's what an epistemic framework is for. Which and is to say that those things that, that you were talking about, how beneficial religion are, and maybe those religious directives in moral uh, commands are should be seen in functional ways, which is like... Well, what that, are they that's true, about? certainly, but it's also true epistemically in the sense that, you know, I, I personally, when I think about adding God to my picture of the universe, right? Would that help me understand anything specific better? And the answer is no. In fact, it would make a lot of things very mysterious. Yeah. And, and that's where you get into things like the problem of evil, right? They're not necessarily logical proofs that God does not exist. But there's certainly problems that the atheist just doesn't have to deal with, right? They're, they're epistemic challenges that only come into play once you introduce into your schema a perfectly good, all-powerful, all-loving, you know, um, you know uh, omni-benevolent being. And if you just leave that out of your picture of the universe, you don't have to deal with the problem of evil because, of course, you know, there's going to be suffering or not in the, a naturally developed universe like ours. So um, I don't, yeah. yeah, I don't, yeah, there's nothing, there's Paul, nothing Paul that I can point to that would, that, that would be better explained 
if we introduce God. So I just don't see the point of it as an idea. I utterly agree. Paul, Paul Jenkins, a uh, friend from the Portsmouth area around here, uh, says, would an existing God really need some overly technical proof of its existence? Well, of course, you know, there could be a reason why God would need some overly technical proof of his own existence. So, you know, let's just, you know, pump for uh, sceptical theism that God, there might be a reason. We just don't know the money. God moves in mysterious ways. It's the answer to everything. Yeah, I, I mean, that's a that's a really interesting th point, which is that uh, I I agree with Sean Carroll, who the, who once said, basically, if if God existed, it should be perfectly obvious, right? There should be yeah. there should be all sorts of evidence that such an intelligence exists. I've done a fair amount of work responding, for instance, to intelligent design arguments, particularly newer intelligent design arguments, like Stephen Meyer's new book, The God Hypothesis. Yeah. I did a discussion with him about that book, and what I found really interesting was, and this is true of a, a lot of arguments, I think, for the existence of God, is how epistemically unusual it was how actually it didn't track how we make decisions about what's true or false in our ordinary lives at all even though they always claim that they're doing the same thing that scientists are doing or it, it actually didn't match whatsoever right so so intelligent designers like to say you know here's a series of criteria that we can use to identify if something's been created by an intelligence like does it have specified complex information or whatever it is you know the the latest thing they've come up with and and the the fact is that none of us uses a criterion like that ever in our everyday lives to determine if something was created by an intelligence we actually have to have a whole set of epistemic frameworks in place in order to determine that so basically we need to know that something a, a relevant agent exists and is capable of bringing about the effect that we observe and is likely to bring about the effect that we observe. And once we already know that, then we make inferences all the time that, that a particular effect may have been caused by that agent, but we need to know it exists first. And that's just an example of how I think a lot of apologetics relies on very weird epistemology that's very far away from how we every day make sense of our world. And so it just Present doesn't seem very relevant to me. Presenting more hoops to jump through and, and kind of defying Occam's razor, which is to say, you know, two competing hypotheses that, that both had the same explanatory power and scope, the one with the fewest entities, un, you know, un, is the preferable one, the one that multiplies entities unnecessarily should be the least attractive hypothesis. And I think the God hypothesis just, there's so many contrived, you know, barriers and hoops you've got to jump through and over. It's just, um, yeah. Um, but now, now flip it the other way. Well, what what's a what's a big challenge? Do you think for atheism, it, or is there one? Is is there is it is there something that keeps you up at night that makes you think ah uh, that I'm not I uh, don't quite I can't I can't give an answer to that. There, people, or when I say this, right, intellectually sophisticated, philosophically minded atheists tend to be like, oh, you're just not taking the argument seriously. Honestly. I don't think any of the arguments in favor of the existence of God are any good. I don't I... think that they are close to being successful, any of them. And in fact, I think most of them are quite obviously false. Yeah. Um, what were the, the only thing I think that would move me to believe in God, well, I guess two things. Firstly, increasingly through my work um, at the Ethical Society, I've come to appreciate that it actually what people believe about God or the afterlife or metaphysical reality is is not actually very important. Uh, it it doesn't make all the difference in how they act and behave towards each other than one might think. And I think some some atheists believe that the most important thing is actually how we treat each other and the world that we want to create. And I work every day with incredibly principled believers who want to create exactly the sort of world that I want to inhabit. And they explain it in theistic terms and I don't. And that isn't a problem. And so increasingly, it doesn't matter. You're absolutely um, right. Like Dan Barker talks about this in his book, Mere Morality, which I think is a really, really good book, uh, where he talks about like the Bible is just a bunch of 
dictates about telling us how we should react with God, you know, in terms of God and in relationship with God. We should put no other gods before God. And we should uh, and we should do this ritual and we should do that. It's all about a very authoritarian understanding of morality in terms of a relationship with God, whereas there's very little in the Bible uh, about interpersonal relationships which is you know if you'd are to ask people just generally in society what they thought about morality it's how we go about living this world to make this world a better place through our interactions with each other you know that's humanism yes but, but there's right. very little very little of that in the bible which purports to be uh, uh this great moral uh, revelation but it, it's it, it's just a like or well, how to please god you know, directly and not not with in relation in the context of like how we treat each other. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. Um, uh, and so that that has increasingly become the focus of my concern. So increasingly, my atheism is less an important part of who I am. And so that inevitably mean I don't hold on to it as hard as I used to because I don't. I honestly don't think I need it in the sense that that if I was to be convinced tomorrow that God exists, I don't think that would change everything about 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 what I who I was or what I believed, which wasn't true even 10 years ago for me. Um, mm -hmm. But the other thing is, I, I, I think I am by nature very emotive, instinctive. Um, I'm moved by things and I've had what would categorizes religious experiences or peak experiences if you use maslow's term for that and in my life that that have given me the feeling that there is something out there and i still have them sometimes and sometimes they're very powerful and persuasive and i could see having a sufficiently powerful and persuasive feeling like that that would make me think oh no th there there is a god but but it wouldn't be the God I would then believe in, right? In any circumstance like that, would not be um, a like a Christian God or you know a, a a Jewish God or Muslim God or anything like that. It would be a kind of deistic kind of life force or something like that, and it would be and it would not care about who sleeps with who or any of that stuff. It would have no care for the the doings of people at all it would just be a sustaining force or something like that so uh, i could see myself getting to that place experientially and i hope that if i ever did i would i would say oh by the way i have no arguments for this i think it's totally irrational it's just what i feel to be true and then i would just embrace the reaction the irrationality of it and and be be fine with that but i i don't i, I don't find any of the arguments actually very convincing i i find them increasingly very uh dull honestly yeah no i generally agree with you i mean the only thing that would keep me up at night isn't particularly it's the same argument i think a theist or the same wonder a theist would have which is i i sometimes think why is it something rather than nothing and it's a question that you just i don't think can ever be answered but yeah. if, I, if i was a theist i'd i'd still think exactly that well you know why is there something rather than nothing including god you know why why is there a god rather than no god oh, and, and i think bit. yes right I, I i my suspicion about that question is that probably on analysis will go away. I think it's probably one of those questions that doesn't actually make sense to ask. Um, I, I think that a lot of philosophy is hung up on badly posed questions. And that once you recognize that the question is poorly posed, it becomes either not a mystery at all, or just or you realize, oh, I, it sounded like I was asking a reasonable question, but actually I wasn't. And I suspect that one counts as one of those. Um, but I can't give you an argument as to exactly how it does yet. <laughs> Brilliant. I believe you. Um, but uh, so you uh, touched on sexual ethics there a little bit. Um, I've just written a piece for Only Sky, actually, on how uh, homosexuality is a barrier to retention for um, f in, in Christianity. Uh, both in terms of like, um, I guess, uh, like uh, the 
scriptural side of things. So in terms of what certain uh, chapter and verse say in the Bible or, or in the Hebrew Bible is can evidently be used as a pretty, um, you know, big barrier to entry for, for anyone who wants to, you know, join Christianity who might be, you know, not heterosexual. Uh, but then also you have the whole in-group, out-group kind of uh, conservative church, like social community uh, and the prejudice that can, can come along with that. So there's like a, a two-horned, um, two-pronged, you know, problem for people who, who you know, don't identify as heterosexual. And that's a massive problem given the the huge demographic segment that non heterosexual people uh, represent worldwide. Um, and you know, you can talk anywhere, but maybe up to like around fifteen percent of people might not identify as as heterosexual, or even if it's as low as say five percent, that's still a huge number of people given seven billion people on the planet. So. Uh, how how what are your thoughts on that generally and like is is this you know is it because we're talking about design arguments a little bit earlier with, with with regard to god i mean for the for me this is just another hugely problematic de design argument to be leveled at theists why because because uh, god wouldn't make gay people well yeah it seems really bizarre to make or, or uh, maybe uh, god would make everyone gay well, yeah, so that would, like, be, that would be a perfect world. But actually, so it's the same argument for like I've used this argument for people with phobias. I've used this argument for uh, people on the autistic spectrum who have a lower propensity to believe in in a personal deity. Uh, I've talked mm. about this in terms of men and women. Women are more likely to believe than men. So all of these, as soon as you create, as soon as God supposedly creates a subset of people who are less likely to believe in Him or less likely to enter a loving relationship. Oh, I see. Them, yeah. Then, then God is is automatically unfair and therefore not omnibenevolent, and we have a real big problem. So, if God is creating a, a certain subset of people who are more likely to sin, then uh, and and that's you know a problem for for judgment in terms of I don't know heaven and hell, but even judgment in our living world, and and being able to access God's love uh, as easily, then we've we've got a real problem. God is clearly unfair. Yeah, I mean, so th there's a, a million pieces to the question that you've asked there. <laughs> yeah. um, one of them being like, why would a loving God set up things in exactly this way, right? Like, and I think that's that it's just more evidence that we're an evolved species and that there's natural variation within the species. And for whatever reason, you know, different people have different sexual orientations. Um, it does seem like a weird way to design things uh, to do it like that. I mean, not necessarily a bad way or a good way, but just an unusual way. It would, it, it's difficult to figure out why. And that might be one reason why, um, why traditionally many religions, not just Christianity, but Islam and Judaism and many, many others have had real struggles incorporating gay people, lesbian people, bisexual people into their idea of what is an acceptable way to be a human i mean i think that there is something i think there is a potential inherent tension between the teleological nature of theistic thought and the existence of queer folk right who we are sort of rad radical departure from what's usually considered as a very important norm and so if if there is a design right behind why people are the way they are, then you either have to come up with what is immediately going to feel like quite ad hoc reason for the design for queer people to exist yeah. to be the way it is, or deny that queer people actually do exist, which is what a lot of religious conservatives do. They just say like it's a, a, a sexually immoral choice that people are engaging in, and there isn't. It isn't actually real that people are gay or lesbian or whatever. Or, or you have to say that there's something wrong with them because they're out of step with the design. Mm. 
right? Which, and which none of those say, options are very in, comfortable. Well, invariably it ends up being um, because God cannot be at fault, right? So the, right, the, job right. of, the job of theology is to keep God up here, right? And as soon as God is, is held responsible for any kind of like imperfection, then God isn't perfect himself. So therefore it has to be the fault of humans for anything that goes wrong. Right. This is kind of like the fall, original sin or or any other way of looking at, it, you know, free will, blah, 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 blah. So when it comes to things like, um, you know, homosexuality, for example. So if it, if you believe homosexuality is a sin or 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 the act of homosexuality or however you want to, you know, portray the 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 issue, then um, it has to be humans fault for that. Like God cannot be responsible. So therefore, like you were saying, it's not a design thing. People aren't inherently or biologically. There's no, there can be no kind of biological um, determination in, in why people end up being homosexual. It, it has to be choice because if it's choice, then we can hang all the blame on humans. Yes. Because, yeah. Yeah. I think that I think that's exactly right, and that's why I'm I personally, as a gay man who's who works in the kind of broadly religious kind of sphere in terms of the sort of work that I do I, I am always skeptical when religious groups claim to be fully accepting of queer people because my experience has been that what actually happens is after a huge battle and enormous misery and a lot of ruined lives along the way uh, a little bit of acceptance is extended to the queer people most close to the heterosexual norm. And then they realize, oh, there's other people. Like, oh, now trans people exist. Oh, well, shit, well, we don't want them, right? And then there's another fucking battle, you know, to to expand the idea of of humanity to en encompass those people. And it's always I mean, a war. Goodness me, we'd only, we'd only just stopped enslaving black people. It's like... It's, it's very, very difficult. These These... And it doesn't just happen within religion, right? It happens in so that's the story of society as well, right? Secular society as well. But there's something mm. about mm. the teleological understanding of human beings, the idea that we were designed to be a particular way that queerness really fucks with. And they don't like that. They don't like the fact that we're outside these categories. And it causes a problem. There are theologically respectable, more or less, ways of, of getting outside that, right? There's queer theologies, right? There are ones that say, no, God is gay, or God is gender fluid, or ge like if God exists, right, it's not going to have a gender. No, yeah, right? yeah. And the, and then the most gender expansive thing that must exist must be God, right? And I would think the most sexually experimental and expressive and wonderful thing would probably be God, right? And there are queer theologians who say exactly that, who say, no, the problem is human beings' understanding of God is very restrictive. And But the, the, the difficulty is those are always going to be fringe narratives, at least in my lifetime, right? They're going to be fringe narratives kind of nipping on the outsides of these monolithic traditions that have stamped on queer people for millennia. And so I... I'm always suspicious. That said, a, a hell of a lot of LGBTQIA plus people are religious and very particularly spiritual. There is a lot of alternative spirituality within the queer community. And LGBTQ activism is often quite religious, at least the organizations. I think that some of it is a, a reaction to stigmatization by religion so that so you go to something like Creating Change, which is the annual conference of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force, I think that's its name, in America. Um, the biggest activist organization for LGBTQIA plus people in the United States. have this massive annual conference. It's really amazing. Like they get really famous people to come and it's, everyone tries to share skills and you know, plan for, for what we're going to do in the next year and hook up with everybody they possibly can. And it's a big festival of activism and um, it's always filled with religion. So much religion. I mean, indigenous religion, like um, um, pagan, um, bunches of clergy in their stoles and, and their robes and like so much religion, whole interfaith 
series of programming, which basically is always theistic, right? They would be a real struggle to get more of the atheistic yeah. programming. Yeah. Really, you can just pick your religion. You, you pick what you want to believe. I remember teaching a kid once, and and he and I, we did the we did the Vikings right, taught the Vikings, and he was, went away and learnt loads about Norse gods and whatnot, and then just came came in one day and he was like, "I'm going to believe in I'm going to believe in the Norse gods now." And I was like, "You can't do that. You can't just go. I really like these gods. I'm going to believe in these gods now. They're cool." And like make yourself believe in them. That's not how things work. But for him, it was. Yeah, yeah it's it's a it's a source of uh, slight bafflement to me why a lot of queer people embrace some elements of religion and new age spirituality and things like that. I I've tried to understand it because I, I would think that the last thing you'd want to be is is like a gay Christian, right? Given the history of that religion you know again there are accepting strands but they're so recent and they have had mm. to fight so hard and i just would think well why would you want to be part of that the desire for belonging is very very strong in us particularly those of us who've been rejected by society sometimes by our families by our friends um and yeah that's an interesting observation actually yeah and and that i don't know there's something about there is something gleefully anarchic in the best of queer culture that that fits in somehow with tarot cards and psychic phenomena and like the weird and, and wacky element of the human psyche. And that I think I, I think that's ultimately I prefer that to be a part of it than it all to be heavily corporatized pride celebrations with like, you know, everyone in there target rainbow you know whatever it is like so so uh, there's uh, i have a certain fondness for it but it is it is it, it, the i guess it's alternative spirituality that's very big in queer communities and since it's an alternative community in its own way that probably makes sense but it's an interesting phenomenon the relationship between queer people and religion is very complex talking uh, uh, about the gender of god um <laughs> I'm, getting, I'm getting that feedback again i don't know a view that's weird um oh that's cool thank you uh but uh yeah so talking about the gender of god i remember coming i've got 11 year old twin boys and uh one of my boys he's quite a challenging chat but um he was uh you know he's always asked me about god and he knows i don't believe in god but i don't want him to believe in in what i believe in just because i believe it so i want to teach him the right sort of skills but anyway he's adamant he just doesn't believe in god because i don't and it, so that's the challenge but one thing he couldn't get over i was like trying to explain that if god is this abstract entity god is not a human doesn't have a body god is this abstract entity that exists existed before all matter you know, causally before all matter, then God doesn't have a body, doesn't have any organs. God doesn't have a gender. God is not a ma male or female. And he's like, no, no, that can't be. No, God is definitely a man. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> God can't. And he just won't have it. It's just like, he doesn't even believe in God, but he's like, God is a man. I'm like, okay, fair enough. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's one of those, it's another one of those things that shows how deeply human religion actually is. That... Mm. It's bound up in all the stereotypes and assumptions of human cultures and the cultures that create and sustain them. So obviously that, you know, God is very often overwhelmingly presented and referred to as male in our contemporary culture. Right. And that's very, very it's sexism it's just a representative sexism god is like the ultimate boss right and 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 sexism says bosses have to be men right so so obviously god's going to be a man and it you, you can hear something like that and dismiss it and be like oh yeah whatever it's just like a naming convention but but when you see the pushback that people get when they purposefully provocatively talk about god using female pronouns right I do that sometimes, okay. just for a laugh. I, I, I say God, it. All right, I always try and say it. Right? Well, I've just there. written this book. I've just written this book, right? came out uh, like a month or so ago, two months ago. And I purposely called God it in this in this 
for the entire book. I can't tell you how hard that was to write and how many Wait. edits I had to go back and go, oh, I've got a freaking he in there or oh, another he in there. Just it was difficult. And it Sometimes reads weirdly a little bit. It, just to amuse myself. But 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 the but it is difficult because we we're acculturated to think in particular ways. And mm. and you know you, you see of course, there's a connection between the masculinization of the concept of God and the fact that men have run these religions for millennia and have excluded women from positions of authority almost all the time. Right? You look at something like the Church of England, which is still riven internally by a question over whether women can be, be priests. I mean, what on earth? It's the 21st century, for goodness sake. I mean, the fact that they're even having that conversation is insane. And yet they continue to be unable to make that progress. And of course, this is all linked to... Hey, there's steps ahead of the Catholics. Sorry, say again? There's steps ahead of the Catholics. Oh, whole steps and a half, I would say. But I mean, it's just... it, And it's sad, ultimately. It's one of the reasons why I really am invested in the work that, that we do at the Ethical Society, which is that... Isn't it sad that so many of the few spaces we have that bring human beings together to articulate a different vision about how we might live together and what life might be about and how we might work towards the common good and all those good things that religions at their best do, that so many of those spaces, almost all of them, are yoked to ancient and discredited fantasies? <laughs> Instead of being informed by our best understanding of humankind and of the cosmos in which we live, right? We, we've got to the point almost in many wealthy nations where the only community organizations that provide this sort of experience for people are religious ones, and they are all committed to demonstrably false and outdated beliefs. I mean, that's awful. We, we really need to replace these places with contemporary expressions of the human desire to belong, to become greater than ourselves, to, to be part of something bigger than our individual existence. And we're not doing it. So, anyway. Amen, brother. Amen, brother. And you know what? West Philemon agrees. Yes. Totally agree. So, one. You know, one. <laughs> um, so uh, just a uh, last sort of little bit on uh, homosexuality yeah, or non-heterosexuality. In terms of the the future of, say, Christianity, and I use Christianity as an example, but given that that Christianity is arguably in decline, not arguably, it is in decline, although oddly enough, annoyingly enough, evangelical Christianity around the world appears not to be in decline. Uh, maybe that that maybe that's to do with what I'm going to say, but. But homosexuality and and other moral modern moral sort of progr progress um, is is why millennials and Gen Z uh, or part of the reason why they are leaving organized religion because actually their sense of what a modern moral life is precludes you know the kind of moral dictates of of their church or this church or that church yes and and so therefore you know religion presents a problem for the modern person uh and 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 that's an issue because that seems to be the direction we're traveling in despite what you know supreme court in america might be saying now and again yes uh, and and i so my question is kind of like do you see this is a long-term problem for for, for for christianity for example for churches in say america or do you think that they will adapt or do you think that the evangelicalism will hold on and be a home for the for the bigoted and the conservatives i don't know yes to all of them i mean all <laughs> of those things will happen right hmm. so yes these denominations will slowly become more accepting because they will firstly we have won the argument right the rational case for or the acceptance, as it were, of, of LGBTQIA plus people is made, right? Tra let's put tra trans people in a different category just for the purposes of whether the rational argument has been successfully won, because I think we've got a lot more fighting to do for trans folks over the next few years, particularly. Um, secondly, because we've created a climate, luckily, where 
it is relatively safe for most of us to come out now in the United States and in the UK, which even 50 years ago it wasn't. Mm. Um, and so we've we've created a new culture where more and more people know LGBTQIA plus people and particularly it's that normalization, that normalization. Yeah. exactly that yeah. we're members of their family that that they do business with us that they mm. you know almost everyone is going to have a relative who's who's part of our community now because more of us are coming out and there there are actually quite a lot of us um so yes the some of the churches will catch up it will take a long time but they will slowly 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 change what will will happen is they'll start to splinter as the parts of the churches that won't accept that will go their own way. Or sometimes, as is happening with the Methodist Church in the United States, the United Methodists, the progressives will splinter off. So the United Methodist Church has, has had a series of votes about being opening, open and affirming of LGBTQ people, and it's voted the wrong way recently. And the progressive communities within who want to be opening and firming are going to just leave and make their own denomination. That seems to be what's going to happen now. And that will happen increasingly. And whenever large denominations splinter, they become less influential inevitably. Mm. So that will decrease the influence of religion and it will drive people, you know, it will drive conservatives to those holdouts, those conservative holdout organizations that still have the, traditional positions on these issues and it will drive increasingly young people away from wanting to be associated with religion at all and that's one of the main reasons if you look at a book like american grace which i think is the best sociological analysis of contemporary american religious life huge demographic studies of, of american religion and analyses of them um one of the main reasons people are turning away from particularly Christianity in the United States, but religion as a whole, is that young people associate religion with outdated, conservative, and frankly, mean social beliefs. Mm. And they don't That's want what to I was trying to say. You said it better than I had. But yeah. yeah. And, and so all those things will happen. And eventually, and, and America is rapidly secularizing. It's still much more religious than the UK and most European countries. And the power of religion, the cultural influence of religion is massive here. Dis state. Disproportionate both in, in like terms of lobbying and the financial oh, yes. clout it has, but yes. also, uh, uh, also, but possibly because of that, also in terms of representation politically, because of course, you know, virtually every um lawmaker in america has to proclaim that they're religious and you know and the place that religious people have is disproportionate uh, you know in in terms of of politics compared to to the national you know demographic that exists and so therefore yeah it is it is a completely stacked um the the dice are loaded in 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 favor of religion in america and it, and that's really really frustrating but but it is slowly moving in the right direction you're absolutely right yeah i think that's exactly right um so yes um uh what i was going i just just going to return a little bit to is there anything else you wanted to say about sexual ethics and and religion particularly? i don't how long do you usually go on for Jonathan? Uh, no, because... normally about an hour and a half if, but okay good might... yeah so so in about 10 minutes i'm gonna have to run because i'm going to the opera yeah. this evening to see an opera about the life of harvey milk so that's oh, there you go really cool it's rather linked to kind of sexual ethics i suppose exactly um, Yes, uh, but I was going to move away from that unless you had anything else to say. No, that's fine. Please, please move um, away. Just a nice uh, a quote from one of the pieces that you sent me. Um, uh, and going back to uh, it is revisiting our place in the universe and our sort of meaning and purpose and setting up. Uh, before I ask what you think our our the the meaning of our lives is, if there is. Such a <laughs> Because that's, that's a small 10-minute one, right? Five-minute co conversation. So once upon a time, setting out from the Pillars of Hercules and heading for the Western Ocean with a fair wind, I went a-voyaging. The motive and purpose of my journey lay in my intellectual activity and desire for adventure. 
And in my wish to find out what the end of the ocean was and who the people were that lived on the other side. So wrote Lucian of uh, uh, Samosata, a satirist of some renown from the Roman province of Syria in the second century CE. This idea that that's almost like our search for alien life, but also the the journey of going there. There's a lot mixed up in that in that little quote about, you know, meaning and purpose and an adventure and discovery. And also the idea that other other things might exist out there. Um, Do do you think do you think we're alone? Do you think that changes things for religious people if we if there is intelligent life out there? And what's our place in, in in the cosmos? I don't think we're alone in the universe. No, I, I, I think that that would be incredibly unlikely, given how vast the universe is. I don't mm. put a lot of stock in things like the Drake equation. I find them fun to think about. Mm. The Drake equation being the the way that it's an equation for figuring out the likelihood that, or indeed the number of of alien civilizations that might be out there, right? Um, I th- and I think it's nonsense, basically, but it's fun nonsense. Um, and I, I love to think about the existence of alien life, but my basic position is that, obviously, I think we evolved through entirely natural causes on this planet, which means that it's possible that it happened on other planets. I think it's incredibly unlikely that it just so would happen that the conditions are so limited for the development of life that it could it could only have happened once in the entire universe that that seems to be that would be intriguing if we were, we would never find out if that's true but um i so i do, i doubt that we're alone in the universe i i i rather doubt we will ever find anyone else though because the universe is very very big and that might put us in a sad position of of always not knowing the answer to this question, but wanting to know. And I think human beings do want to know. I think the preponderance of stories like that one from, from Lucian from so, so so many years ago, thousands of years ago, uh, that, that's about kind of reaching out and finding who else might be out there. I think that human beings instinctively understand that a universe in which we are the only species like us i don't want to say intelligent species because that's not quite right but species with the sort of intellectual capacities that we have while we think we're the only one of that that's a different type of universe than one where there's even one other species like that another type of humanity as it were out there let alone billions right right but but the big difference is between one and more than one right if there's another one out there then we know we're not alone. And and there's something existentially totemic about that, I think. I mean, it just changes your picture. Because if you imagine the whole cosmos and, and there's one little tiny speck of it, one tiny planet on which, you know, is a boat for life like ours and nothing else. That's like one gives me one feeling. I don't really know how to describe it. But you imagine even just one other speck out there and it's like, OK, OK, it's not just us. They're, and I think it would and then, then we, then we contact them and, and it's aliens from like, you know, the film <laughs> Alien. And you're like, oh, what a oh, chance. Shit. Yeah, that sucks. Yeah. Oh, we got so unlucky. <laughs> Um, but even that would be amazing, wouldn't it? And, and everyone knows it would be amazing. And so and I think that it, it, it would... I mean, it would be very difficult to look at something like Genesis the same way again, wouldn't it? Right, yeah. which is so human centric. I think that that's what it would do. It would kick us out of thinking. I mean, a lot of first contact stories. I love first contact stories. Right, they have a similar shape to them. Right, which is that the the encountering alien life somehow unites humanity, either to fight the alien life, like in Independence Day, mm. right, or to in a kind of spirit of brotherhood where we're like oh i guess we're not so much different from each other because there's this whole totally different thing which is very different from us wow and that's the kind of star trek version of first contact where coming into contact with the with the vulcans changes human culture so it becomes less warlike and it's after world war three and everyone kind of starts working together but I, i think there's some sort of deep existential truth in that that sudden 
suddenly our differences from each other as individual humans and individual human cultures seem a lot less significant if you have an alien species to compare it to. Suddenly we all look very much the same. Yeah, and, I, I've often yeah. thought like if you ever want anything to unite, you need a common enemy. You know, what unites Europe? Well, if we we're being attacked from somewhere <laughs> else, and like what, you know, you, you see it in wars. Uh, what unites Britain? What what would unite all our div divided like nation at the moment? What would unite America at the moment? If you were attacked by another nation, then Democrats oh, and Republicans would put aside their differences. Well, or what would unite? Well, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Uh, but yeah, what we had an we had a terrorist attack on the Capitol. That didn't do it. Uh, but um, yeah. but but the the yeah, I think I think that's right. You think of what happened in in the comic Watchmen, where where. I don't know if I want to spoil it, but but a, a common enemy comes to exist, which exactly does that. It's, it's for mm. the purpose of uniting humanity against that common enemy. Um, and so, but I don't think it has to be an enemy. I think it's just the insight that humanity is one bucket with intelligent creatures in, and suddenly there's another bucket, right? So now our sameness becomes a lot more salient to us and i think that there's a kind of rich emotional truth in those stories that recognize it would be one of the most profound discoveries and and i i'm i i doubt we'll ever make it honestly i think i think that it seems unlikely how the universe seems to be set up that we will ever encounter in life but we should totally look that we should look not just because finding it would be so profound but we should look because the looking itself says something about us and what sort of mm. species we want to be. That we want to be outward looking and searching and learning and explorers. I think there's something deeply romantic about SETI, even though I think it's almost certainly doomed to failure, right? I still think it's something we should do and put money yeah. into, and I, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, that's, uh, I always say we're quarantined by distance. You know, there's almost certainly yes, life out nice. there. It's just, just too far. Um, so, okay. So thank you so much for your time. Uh, what usually happens at the end is I do some quick fire questions that, okay. that, that you can't really think about. Uh, so here goes. Um, first of all, favorite nonfiction book. Maybe oh I've never really thought about this. I'll go I'll go for Genius, which is the, the biography of Richard Feynman. Just the one oh. that comes to mind. Oh nice one. Uh favorite fiction book. Um let's the His Dark Materials trilogy. Oh, okay, good, good, good. The good um, the BBC HBO co production is is really very good. Have you seen that? Yep, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yes. Um, uh, okay. If you were to write a graphic novel, uh, what what would the setting be? Oh, I've thought about this a lot. I would do a graphic novel that's set in like the modern day, but some people are secretly angels, and there's like like the 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 kind of black winged, gothy looking kind of traditionally evil aliens and the and the and the kind of white winged like really beautiful looking traditionally good aliens but actually aliens the, or angels uh, sorry angels yes angels and and but but actually the 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 fallen angels are the good guys and and they're fighting against the oppressive forces of god i've thought about that a lot i didn't describe it well but in my mind i've it, i've got it all planned out if anyone um, wants to make my comic hit me up um just one from roger jonkers here so which you here is the most moral and why that's a really interesting question And uh, uh, Professor can, X, Professor X from the yeah, because X because he's like the the epitome of a humanist. He's an educator. He's trying to create a better world through helping people understand each other and reducing prejudice. Um, uh, but but I do have days when I have Magneto days as well. Fair enough. Who um, favorite movie? Cosmos. Nice. Uh, that's a TV show. 
Cosmos. Okay, fine then. Contact uh, something by Carl Sagan. But it's, it's in the end of Carl, it's a year since I saw Contact. But don't, don't they mess with the ending of Contact and don't do it as Carl Sagan would have wanted it. Uh, I can't remember. It's been a while since I've read the book. I have read. I've the not book read the book. But I, I watched I that did, before. I thought I the didn't... ending was pretty similar, but I, I, I can't remember. But I love the movie. But if you're not happy with that one, I just watched Arrival again. That's one of my favorites. Right. Uh, you, as soon as you said uh, you like first contact movies, like that's a first, or, or stories, that's that came to mind actually. Arrival so, hits all my buttons. It's first contact story. It's um, uh, one in which. The aliens are treated with suspicion, but they actually want to help us, and it's got time travel shenanigans. It's the best. If you could see a, a band or a musician or uh, some musical entity, dead or alive, uh, that you haven't seen previously, who would it be? Wow. The Beatles. If I hadn't seen anyone, I would like to see them. Yeah, there you go. I mean, you know, some people you think, oh, that's too cliche. But, of course, it's cliche for a reason, right? So, yes, I'd love to yeah. see that. Yeah. Um, so you are just about to be executed. Huh. Uh, sorry, sorry about that. Um, uh, you can pick the reason why, uh, but it's going to happen. And you're given a last supper. What would it be? What would your last meal be? Ooh, it might be uh, the thing that comes to mind is pizza. I love pizza. So probably it's going to sound really bad, but there's a pizza I or always order at Pizza Express that I would have. How sad is that? The Calabria pizza. Yeah, yeah, job done. Um, if you could, uh, two more questions. If you could act, if you could be, have been in any movie that's ever been made, like one, is there one character or, or performance that you would like to have done yourself? Uh, I, I would have liked to have played Hamlet. And it wouldn't have to be a film of Hamlet, but it would be a play. I always said I was going to do that before I was 30. I'm 40 in January, and I haven't done it. So I'd still like to do that. Well, that's what you're doing next year, isn't it? Um, yeah, and, exactly. and last question is, uh, you are. this is going to be the zombie apocalypse. It's going to happen. But luckily, you, are, you have a bunker that you've prepped up just at the end of your garden. Uh, so you rush down the bunker and you can just have time to take three people with you, dead or alive, can't take any family or friends. What three people would you take to live with for a month in a bunker? Oh, wow. But not my family and friends. So so apologies to my family and friends. Yeah. Who would I want to live with? Well, obviously, given everything I've said, I'd take Carl Sagan. Yeah. That'd be sweet. Um, I think I'd want to take... Say it again, Carl, in that voice. Say it again. What, for the 19,000th time? Yeah, say it again, Carl. He's amazing. I would want I would want to just talk his ear off about everything. Um, I think I'd want to take a really, like there's a huge list of super inspiring activists, people who've worked for the, the betterment of the world, people I, I would like to have met. I mean, maybe, oh, I don't know. It's a difficult one. Maybe Harvey Milk would be one of them. I'd like to meet Harvey. Um, and uh, it couldn't be someone alive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. If it can be someone alive, then I would like to take Michelle Nichols, who's Uhura in Star Trek, because I think she's fantastic. And I think she'd be a lot of fun. And she's, she, I think she'd also be very um, calm. Yeah, yeah, because things can get heated when you're... Uh discussing the cosmos um look thank you so much for the time you spent with me discussing all these myriad things uh um just before you go west does want to ask who's your favorite comedian just that last quick you know i don't spend as much time watching comedy as i should um but it would probably be i'm trying to think um, Stuart Lee. Oh, I'm really getting into him at the moment. I, yeah, I don't think I was clever. I was don't think I was clever enough to get him, or or knowledge not clever, knowledgeable enough about stuff to get Stuart Lee <laughs> until recently. And now I think he is an absolute genius. And I yes. watched a video, um, like analyzing what he does with his comedy, and yes. it like blew my mind. Yeah, he has a book called How I Escaped My Certain Fate. And it is 
a book length analysis of one of his own shows. And you can watch the show and read the book at the same time. And it's incredibly smart. Like, it's incredibly insightful about how comedy works. And it's, I love writing about how art does what it does. That's one of the areas of philosophical interest I had when I was in grad school was, was aesthetics and the philosophy of art. And it's a really profound piece of aesthetics. And I, I love it. So that's why I chose him. Stuart Lee is the most meta comedian you will ever, ever listen yes, to. Yes. Uh, Ricky Johnson, thank you so much for your super sticker. Really, really kind. And thank you, James, for your super chat earlier. Um, thank you, James, uh, different James, uh, for your, your time today. Um, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. It's been fascinating. Uh, I wish you all the very best in, in what you're going to do next, but you will Thank continue you. to be a, a colleague of mine writing at Only, Only Sky. Please check James out there at Only Sky, but also you can check him out um, at his website here, which is just a white screen. So that's Yeah, amazing. I was going to say, it's a really great website. Uh, there we go. Weird this whole time. There we go. That's um, me. Look at me looking pre-covid and svelte uh so you can check out that's at croftspeaks.org um and it looks like he's in a wheelchair there but he's not he's on a bench uh and uh that is um where you can find james please check that out and check him out at only sky um but in the meantime as i said to everyone um you know question everything particularly yourselves guys and uh james what would you like to leave us with uh, anything you'd like to say and where people can uh, catch you and whatnot yeah certainly one thing that people might want to do if they've been interested in our talk about humanist community is check out the ethical society of st louis at ethicalstl.org we actually stream live every one of our sunday programs and anyone's available to anyone's welcome to join you don't have to be a member of our community or give us any money or anything to come we have really fascinating talks on this sunday for instance there's a talk on the neuroscience of criminal behavior our theme this month is i accept responsibility for my choices and actions so we've been exploring the extent to which our choices really are our choices mm -hmm. so i gave a talk on uh, on free will on sunday and then this sunday i can't believe um, we didn't talk about, about that oh about the neuroscience of criminal behavior. And um, you can you can find us as a link on our front page of our website to our platform called Alter, where you can see you know what it looks like to have a humanist congregation. So come and check us out. I suggest you do that, everyone. Uh, that's the Ethical Society of St. Louis. Um, thank you so much, James. You've been an absolute thank pleasure. You. And thank you to all you guys who've been uh, uh, listening and taking part in the conversations at the side. Thanks Toodle so much, everyone. Until next time.